of the most difficult thing is one of the most difficult thing of any presenter is to catch the attention of your audience so as per many neurological studies the attention span of any audience or especially in the student community is almost like 10 to 15 minutes so especially and so but nowadays the classes will last for 30 minutes in an hour so whenever so the people or the students who are listening or sometimes feel they are particularly overwhelmed with the students with a lot of information during the classes so this so it is important that every audience or every presenter should always should catch the attention and so that the person who is learning can enable so the class the students can organize and consolidate all the information to the learning so whenever we are There are two major kinds of communication. One is oral and written communication. So both are, both the things are trying to communicate the same thing, but we they speak the same language for the tool for communication, and both will use the spoken and written form for the language. But the way it was presented is completely different from each other. So especially in oral communication, we always use facial expression, tonality, hand gestures, stage movement, and eye contact. But in the case of written communication, we always use different kinds of dialogues, metaphors, pacing, and show, and we should be expressing it, but not we are not showing of it. And sometimes we should not overshadow the information we are trying to teach. So the both the things are trying to, both the things are aiming to convey the same information, but at the same time, it is present in a different way. But most of the presenters were trying to uh, prepare for any presentation. They try to mix both the skills and little bit in they will present in and out of order. So now we'll move on to what are the different type of oral presentation models we're trying to present here. So in this, we have a lot of presentation slides. So the first kind of model is visual style, freeform style, instructor style, code style, storytelling style, connector style, lesic style, and Takashi style. So it, it is important that presenters should, should choose what is the presentation style they want to present their idea. So before starting it, it is important that what is an idea and what is the presentation style you want to present. It should be chosen first and it should be prepared accordingly. So in this way, you can present your uh, topics and in a, any effective manner. So first thing we'll start with a visual style. So visual style is one of the most common st uh, style which is practiced all over the world. One of the most classic example is uh, the presentation of uh, Steve Jobs. Presentation by Steve Jobs in, uh, in during the uh, introduction of Apple products. So what this actual visual style refers to is if you're believing the slide should simply exist to complement what you're talking. So this is the slide style for you. For example, if you have a slide and if you are complementing the slide with your talking. So this is the style you should adopt. So, but this style is a little bit harder because you need to keep your audience much more engaged. So this could be very useful for any strong public speaking who has a vision and who has an ability to tell a story. So this style can be useful at larger audience with a broader interest. So it is to put together a great slide and to add a communication and verbal communication to present a great visual styling presentation. Second style is a form what we call as a free form style. So this is an impromptu style, which doesn't require any slides. So instead the speaker just uh, relies on the strong stories to express their points. So this style just generally works for the best for those who have a very short presentation time. So if you have given a very short presentation time, but you're extremely familiar with what you're talking. So if you have clear idea about what you're talking, but the presentation time is a little bit less. So this is a style that we can be adopting, which is what we call as a free form style. So especially in networking sites, uh, impromptu meetings and all the scenarios, we can use free form style as a one of your presentation style. So, but this is a little bit less rehearsed and more conversational than you have. So, so this has to be paused in the middle and also to have an happy hour, what we call this um, keeping the audience happy throughout the presentation. That is just cracking a joke in between, making them to come at you, making them to ask questions in between. So this is a kind of an interesting kind of a presentation, what we call as a free form style. Next presentation, what we're trying to introduce is an instructor style. So in this presentation, uh, this is a kind of a presentation style we use to deliver some complex messages uh, used in a, by expressing, by introducing through figures of speech, metaphors and a lot of contents and a lot of proverbs. 
So just like the teachers and the professors of the old, we, we usually hear, they try to introduce an, a, a, a complex subject by using a very small uh, examples. So this should be, a, this. whenever you're choosing an instructor cell, the, one of the most important thing is, you should be building this in a logical order in order to aid your presentation. If your presentation is out of place, if the metaphors are out of place, this could be the could be a this could be a very ineffective ineffective presentation. So this is important. you should be using so along with during this instructor style, it is important that you use high impact visuals so that you can present your ideas and you also you can keep your audience more engaged. So it is more could be useful whenever if you this could be useful to a person who's not actually a comfortable presenter, is comfortably comfortably is unfamiliar with the subject matter, or he could be learned the subject very recently. He has learned the subject recently, but he is not updated with finer points. So this could be a very interesting style of presentation. Those who are not familiar with the subjects or are comfortable with the audience they are speaking. So if you're having that kind of a trouble, so using an instructor cell could be an opportunity to present your ideas. So second style is what we call as a code style. So code style is one of the most uh, uh, one of the most toughest and almost like interesting style of presentation. Uh, this requires an highly energetic and charismatic speaker who always uh, pull the audience towards their style of pressing, pr presenting. It allows them to generally connect and engage with the audience through like using a role play and also with constant interaction with the speakers. So like the example is the motivational speakers who try to connect with you through the emotions and the ideas which they present. So using this style, you, you can speak at a conference or presenting to an audience who needs to put at ease. They are finding it, they're finding it, for example, if you're presenting this idea to an executives or to a company where the details has to be large, but at the same time, it should be to be in, interesting also. So this could be an interesting style of presentation, what we call as a coach style. Second style of presentation, what we one of the most common style which we have always trying to, we have learned through our uh, educational career, which is a storytelling style. So in this particular style, the speaker always relies on anecdotes into starting with a small story and examples so that this audience can connect with what you're speaking. So the stories bring your learning points of life. So mostly the audience will connect to through your emotions and also tell you, and uh, this is one of the most important thing is when you're using the storytelling style, it is important that you say a story in a particularly in an honest way so that the person can easily connect with the emotions you're trying to engage. So this style is also great for conference speaking, uh, network events and sales presentations. So whenever you have an adequate time to tell a story without taking the minutes from the questions are. So using this style could be a very good uh, method to convey many excellent points. Next style of presentation, what I'm trying to say is connector style. So in style, the presenters connect with your audience by showing how they are very much uh, similar to their listeners. For example, you are trying to engage with the audience using a very questionary action and using the hand gestures. So making the audience come towards you, making the audience engage towards what you're trying to speak. So this also encourages them to give the feedback so that you correct in a way or you can improve your presentation during the course of your presentation. So this could be very interesting style of presentation during many, uh, in, when you're presenting a research data on measuring uh, challenges and the goals which you're trying to, uh, we are trying to achieve. So this type of speaking will put your listeners at very ease uh, whenever you're getting the feedback, this will help us to, you're getting the, one of the most interesting thing is in a connector style, you're, you're getting the feedback at the real time so that you're always modifying, you're always changing, you're always evaluating during the presentation. And also the dialogue is now more, it is not a one-sided presentation. Second style, what we're trying to kind of present is what we call this LASIK style. So the LASIK style was actually created by Professor Lawrence LASIK. She, uh, she is a professor of law and leadership at Harvard Law School. So she pro she proposed an idea that is if if your presentation can be presented, if you're develop if you're trying to connect with the audience or presenting a topic in a PowerPoint slides, so each PowerPoint slide can be should be spent only within fifteen seconds. It should be explained within fifteen seconds. So that is the way it is. That is the way. So, so this presentation style requires uh, to present 
at each slide within 15 seconds. So when the text is used as a slide, it should be completely synchronized with the presenter, what they're trying to speak. What I'm trying to explain here is, this is a style of presentation which is useful when you're having a large data, a large PowerPoint to present, but you have to cover all the areas. So all the PowerPoints. So in this case, you can what you can do is you can allot 15 seconds for each slide and explain them in a synchronized manner so that the presentation and the, can easily get the idea. So this will allow the speaker to use a balance of text and image to convert convey the message. So this will go at a very rapid speed and the rhythm of the slide progression uh, will be keeps the audience a little bit more focused, engaged, and also they are less likely to uh, sleep also. So this is one of the most interesting style which was uh, devised by LISIC. So last one, last slide we are trying to uh, we are presenting is Akashi style. So this is one of the most interesting and very unique style of presentation where the presenters will be presenting this idea using a large bold stick text by in a, in a minimal slide. So if you are not comfortable with the technology, if you are not comfortable with the software, if you are not very good at pre preparing your PowerPoint presentation. This could be Takashi one of the most interesting presentation, Takashi what we call as a Takashi style. Who found himself creating? This, this is one of the most, uh, one of the most interesting slides, uh, one of the most uh, interesting way of presenting the idea. So when you're not familiar with the tools or when you're not familiar with developing in a PowerPoint slide or people who are not familiar like old timers can use this PowerPoint presentation where every idea or every slide is explained with a single point. So the main point, word of the focal point of the slide is using a phrase or it should be a short and concise. It should be a little bit, it could be presented in a very bold letters with a single word and the class is entirely built on that slide. So you can build an idea, so you can go to an extent where you can explain a complex idea using a single word. So if you so this kind of a presentation is a very useful for any presenter who doesn't have a familiarity in making the PowerPoint slides. So with this, I'll just complete. So one, one more thing, whatever the style of presentation is, is the most important thing is, is to have a plan and practice and present. So this should this will help you to present in an effective way. So next kind of session, we try to move on to uh, another presenters uh, who will explain the each style with an example which is relevant to a pharmacy. So I'll just hand over to other presenters. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to present on visual style oral presentation on community pharmacy. So let's see what is visual style. If you are a firm believer, slides simply exist to complement your talking points, this style is for you. With this speaking style, you might need to work a little harder to get your audience engaged, but the dividends can be huge for strong public speakers, visualizers, and storytellers. So this is my agenda, so the contents which I'm going to talk on, introductions, talking, dispensing, counseling, and the rules. So pharmacy. Let's start with what is a community pharmacy and on what basis it's working. Traditionally, a pharmacist's role has centrally on the procurement and safe distribution of medication. In recent years, pharmacists have seen expanded role to include a portfolio of clinical service offering like medications, reviews, and clinical adaptations. So here is a typical example for a busy community pharmacy. Pharmac pharmacist must balance checking prescription with physician calls, OTC questions, new work in prescription, and whole lot of other activities. It is understandable that the pro 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 
provision of sustainable professions service could be a challengeable when they're in, in this environment. So next comes the stocking. Stocking. Pharmacy should have an adequate pay, space for storable of drugs. Special logged storage spaces for medications like narcotics, prescribed drugs, etc. The drugs sh stored should not be damaged by the environmental conditions like high temperature, poor ventilation, etc. Why stocking? That is the objectives of stocking. Easy location of drugs, proper identification, fast issue and proper utilization of the space, provide service in most economic way, reduce supply of materials. How is this done? It is done according to the manufacturers, according to pharmacological action, according to the alphabetical order, according to the stock, old stock and date of expiry. Next, let's move on to dispensing. The dispensing area ensures that established policies and procedures are followed. Checks for the accuracy of doses prepared, intravenous admixtures and unit dose. Provides for proper drug control, ensures that drugs are stored and dispensed properly. Ensure that all state and federal drugs laws are followed. Ensure that good techniques are used in compounding intravenous admixtures and ex extemporaneous preparations. Provides for good record keeping and billing. Patient medical records, extemporary compounding records, intravenous admixture records billing, investigational drug records, and reports. It maintains professional competence, particularly in knowledge of drug sustainability and incompatibility. Ensures that new personnel are trained properly in the policies and procedures of the dispensing area. Coordinates the activity of the area with the available staff to make the best possible use of personnel and resources. Keeps the dispensing area neat, neat and orderly communicates with all pharmacy staffs regarding new development in the area and assists in the employee evaluation it provides drug information as necessary to the pharmacy medical and nursing staffs coordinate the overall pharmaceutical needs of the patient cares area with the dispensing area next let's move on to patient counseling Patient counseling normally monitors patients' total drug therapy for efficiency and or non-efficiency, side effects, toxicities, allergic drug reactions, drug interactions, appropriate therapeutic outcomes. Counsel, counsels patients on medication to be self-administered in the hospital, discharge medications. And the most important thing that we have to make sure is better patient understanding of their illness and the role of medication in its treatment. Improved medication adherence, more effective drug treatment, reduced incidence of med medication errors, adverse and unnecessary healthcare cost, improved quality of life of the patients, better coping strategies for medication related adverse effects, improved professional rapport between the patient and the pharmacist. So there are four stages of patient counseling. Preparing for the session, opening the session, counseling content, and the closing of session. So here I have depicted a, a video on based on how a patient has been counseling. A grandmom is being counseled by a pharmacist based on when to take a medicine, how to take a medicine, and a proper schedule of it. Next, let's move on to the role of pharmacist. Role of pharmacist in a clean care services is caregiver, leader, communicator, lifelong learner, a researcher, a manager, a teacher, or ethical decision maker. So normally a patient should have all the uh, available needs from a pharmacist for their use. Thank you for listening. Uh, this is based on visual style. I hope you all understand how a visual style oral presentation is done. If any doubts, you can put it on the comment session. Thank you.
my topic is on instructor style presentation this presentation style allows you to deliver complex messages using figures of speech metaphors and lots of content and visuals to break down a difficult top topic into a simpler terms just like teachers and staff let us move on to a topic uh, which is a monoclonal antibodies in cancer first let us know what is antibodies it is protein in nature they, they fight against the foreign substances like antigen what is monoclonal antibodies uh, it is a type of protein that is made in the laboratory and can bind to a certain targets in the body on this uh, such as antigens on the surface of the cancer cells each monoclonal antibodies binds to only one antigen difference between what is monoclonal antibodies and polyclonal antibodies monoclonal antibodies is monovalent affinity binding only to the same epitope what is epitope the part of antigen that is recognized by the antibody polyclonal antibodies is which binds to multiple epitopes that are usually made by several different antibody and how it is prepared uh, first process, first step is immunization of mice and isolation of splenocytes splenocytes which is a wbc present in a spleen uh, first the mice are immunized with an antigen and later they, their blood is screened for antibody production the antibody which is produced in the splenocytes are isolated and second step is preparation of myeloma cells a myeloma is an immortalized cells a uh, only fused with the spleen cells which is capable of unlimited growth or cancer cell growth uh, which is uh, myeloma cells only capable for fusion next the process of fusion myeloma cells when fused with the isolated splenocytes in the presence of polyethylene glycol with pg which causes cell membrane to fuse next step is clones are screened and selected on the basis of what type of antigen specificity then the functional characterization confirm the function and characterize each potentially producing colonies by antigen scale up and wean scale up clones producing desired antibodies and wean of selection agents then last process is expansion the clones which are expanded produce desired antibodies next what type of drugs are given to cancer as all we know cancers are the unlimited and uncontrolled division of a cell mostly they are uh, the drugs given is cisplatin or carboplatin but uh, most commonly used monoclonal antibodies in cancer is trastuzumab pembrolizumab and rituximab it should be stored under minus 20 degrees celsius in 50% glycerol which is an already stored under saturated ammonia sulfate as pellets at 4 degree celsius or 20 degree celsius for any years without any bacterial contamination or bacterial outgrowth and how the monoclonal antibodies are used in cancer it triggers our immune system when our immune system become weak if this monoclonal antibodies triggers and destroys the outer wall of the cancer cell thereby blocking the unlimited growth of the cell can action of uh, monoclonal antibodies in cancer cells normally in no, uh, normally in our cells expression of epidermal growth factors are very high and very few major histocompatibility complex what is major histocompatibility complex to bind peptide fragments derived from the pathogens and display them on a cell surface for recognition by appropriate t cells in uh, cancer cells there will be a more amount of epidermal growth factor and very few an mhc complex there will be an interaction between the epidermal growth factor receptors and epidermal growth factor so this epidermal growth factor uh, binds on the epidermal growth factor receptors and produces some signal to cell grow and divide whenever in a ca in cancer cell there is uh, this in cancer cell monoclonal antibodies binds to this receptors and block block the growing of cell particularly in trastuzuma which is most commonly used monoclonal antibody block the hcr2 receptor which is present in a cancer cell uh, and and blocks their action next let us move on to side effects by giving monoclonal antibodies it may cause a high bp bleeding poor wound healing blood clots kidney damage and allergic reactions 
this is how you deliver an instructor style presentation thank you for listening if you have any queries put it in chat box Good afternoon, everyone. My topic for the session is code style presentation. A uh, presentation styles are the techniques used when delivering a speech. The best style to choose for a presentation often varies depending on the subject you are discussing. Engaging audience during a presentation can be challenging, but rewarding when you use a method that works best for you. This presentation style is great for speakers who are highly enthusiastic about their topic. they are often excited to teach their audience which makes them more excited to engage and connect with them this method is often used during motivational speeches the coach presentation style is for energetic and charismatic speakers this presentation style works best if the presenter doesn't need to get into details the cons of coach style presentation this style of presentation is not suitable if you are a naturally quiet person There are five quick tips to choose the presentation style. If you are planning a presentation, don't forget to consider presentation techniques and methods as a part of your presentation. Presentation style is how you give your presentation orally. The first one is to consider the topic of your presentation. First, consider the topic of your presentation. Are you presenting a body of work or are you trying to educate your audience? the single most important factor in helping you decide which presentation style to use second point is consider your audience you also need to consider your audience whether are you presenting a brand new group of people or does your audience consist of people who already know you if you are presenting to a brand new audience use interactive or connected presentation and ensure that audience remain engaged throughout the entire presentation The third point is decide on your call to action. Your call to action of your presentation is the most important element to keep in mind. Combine different styles for a more effective presentation. All the presentation styles are highly effective when you are giving a very targeted presentation. Presentation will be more effective while combining different presentation styles. Save time with the template. No matter which presentation style you choose, start with a professional template so that presentation will look polished and unique. A sample coach presentation style, example for a coach presentation, coach style presentation, a teacher's motivational speech on three life lessons every college student must know. I would like to start with an inspired story, which has unfolded in our own country in the recent past and in our own lives. A couple of young gentlemen were working as medical representatives in uh, GSK India, based in Tamil Nadu. Remember, they were simple middle class families without any godfather to push them in the ladder. But they are uh, they are very sincere, hardworking, and by this, obviously, they were quite successful. So they got promoted as the product managers and relocated to various places. they were all they also worked sincerely and created many popular and high performing brands for organization thus they opened a new pharma company at chennai only limited products uh, they began marketing but they focused very hard on various kinds of materials their growth rate after year was very impressive and record breaking they reached market of 100 crores and sold their business for 600 crores to a big pharma company a uh, few years back and now they're ensuring a very secure life the moral behind the story is the unending appetite to reach in whatever we do is definitely a secret behind success life has changed after covid-19 life has thrown new challenges to us i think there are three things every student to know let me share that to you First of all finding yourself where you are now was never your choice 
When you were young, it was your parents who decided things for you. Perhaps they still do. You might not like everything they do and might not agree with all that they decide for you. But there are no perfect parents on earth and yours no exception. Learn to forgive in case they are wrong. Do not give up when you find yourself in a course of study that was never your first choice. Instead, make best use of time and opportunities. Do not compare yourself with others and feel inferior. Negative circumstances are just the right condition for you to excel. Who knows if you show passion for the subject that you find yourself in today, your skill in it might be the most wanted in the changed world tomorrow. The second point is learn to do ordinary things exceptionally well. Let me start from the simplest of examples. From drawing a margin, writing a date in the blackboard, or tying a shoelace are all indicators of greatness. The path is excellence is a habit. No task is below your dignity if you can stamp it with the divine. Nothing left undone that could be done. Attitude. Whatever you do, do it with enthusiasm as there is no second chance. So then aim high, keep on doing the ordinary with the best of your efforts. Every single time you achieve. Third one, you should you arm yourself with hope. Fear and worry, anxiety and despair, feeling of helplessness and hopelessness can cloud your minds anytime. The future has become uncertain like never before. Know that no man can promise you a bright future. Yet, let me remind you never to lose hope, but look ahead to comebacks in life. Have dreams, be thankful and rise above every setback that life can throw at you. This is how you present a code style presentation. I would like to conclude my uh, speech by telling the speak five lines to yourself every morning. So I am the best. I can do it. God is always with me. I am a winner. Today is my day. This is how we present a code style presentation. I hope you all understood uh, the oral presentation code style. Thank you for listening. Please ping your doubts in the chat box. The next is going to be the storytelling style oral presentation. Today, we are here to do story style presentation on gene therapy. As we all know, presentations like stories are meant to inform, inspire, and pursue. Now, let's see what's in this style. In this style, the speaker depends on stories to connect with their audience. This style really works good for conference speaking, networking events, and sales presentations, where you have adequate time to tell your stories without taking minutes away from questions. As we all know, cells are the building blocks of life. Cells contain chromosomes, which contains DNA. Gene, the basic building of heredity. Gene therapy is a technique that uses functional gene to prevent or cure a disease or medical disorder. Inherited genetic diseases like hemophilia and sickle cell disease and acquired disorders like leukemia has been treated with gene therapy. So let's have a look on the history of gene therapy. In 1941, George and Edward prepared a gene defect by adding a missing enzyme to a microorganism. Werner Hamilton and Daniel discovered the restriction enzymes which cut the DNA at specific sites. In 1970, Stanford Roberts conducts the first gene therapy trial on two sisters in Germany. In 1985, W. French Anderson
సర్టిఫికేట్ కోర్సు అటెండ్ చేశారు స్కిల్ డెవలప్మెంట్ జస్ట్ మైక్ మ్యూట్ లేకే మ్యామ్ In 1985, W. Friends Anderson and co-workers used a retrovirus vector to deliver working genes to cells with adenosine deaminase deficiency. In 1990, a successful gene therapy on four-year-old Ashanti D. Sleva was conducted. In 2003, the approval of the production of Gendesin, the first gene therapy drug to reach the market. On 2014, Feng Sang receives U.S. patent for CRI-SPR, a tool for editing DNA strands. Now, let's hear an interesting patient story under gene therapy for inherited blindness. The summer before she started second grade, Hannah read Saya Star for the first time. I took her outside, said, Hannah, can you see that little white light in the sky? That's a star, says her mom, Amy. And she said, I can see it. I can see it. She was so happy. Hannah's vision problems first became apparent when she was just a few months old. She wasn't making eye contact and would only look out window under bright lights. Amy and her husband, Chris, also noticed that Hannah's eyes moved rapidly, a condition called nystagmus. Hannah's pediatrician report had to an ophthalmologist who arranged for her to have a special vision test called ERG, electroretinogram, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. There, the ophthalmologist William, who delivered a uh, devastating news that Hannah had Leber congenital amaurosis, a rare retinal disease. And patients with LCA have very limited vision and eventually, usually in their 20s or 30s, become completely blind. Her mom says it's okay to mourn the loss of the vision. It always makes us cry when we think about it. Genetic testing revealed Hannah had a type of LCA caused by mutations in RPE65 gene. The, the news gave the hope that they had recently learned of a clinical trial undergoing a CHOP hospital and Penn Medicine Center testing a gene therapy for patients with LCA caused by RPE65 mutations. Mm -hmm. Hannah was too young to enroll in the trial and no other treatments were available. There, there was nothing the Reeves could do but wait. Mm -hmm. Hannah came to uh, CHOP hospital every year for checkups with the ophthalmology team and received physical and occupational therapy. She learned to ride a bike and a scooter. She played with her brother. She was able to walk without assistance. And then on December 19, 2017, her family received the news they had been waiting for Lux Turner, the gene therapy for LC developed at Chalk Hospital Pain Medicine uh, has just been approved by FDA. It was the first gene therapy for the gene disease to be approved in US. Chalk eye surgeon Albert, who developed the therapy with a professor of ophthalmology, was one of just a few doctors in the nation to offer it. So the decision to have the procedure done at Chalk Hospital was an easy one. Let's see how the Lux Turner works. Using DNA, scientists create a functioning gene to replace the faulty one in retina. Then they place the new gene inside a little coat made up of viral proteins known as a vector. The type of virus that we does, that use does not have the ability to reproduce or cause disease. To administer Luxterna, doctors add the new gene by injecting it directly into the eye through the pin needle connected to the syringe with the help of light probe. 
the new gene enters the cell nucleus where it makes the healthy enzymes required to see uh, the good copy of the gene starts to replicate and then hana sees that simple the, the same day of surgery july 10 hana has the gene therapy in her left eye and her world changed overnight the next day morning she sat down at her seat at the table and she has little desk lamp that she has always used to do, help brighten up whatever is in front of her she flipped on that light away and she started to cry because it was too bright by she realized she had a vision those big breakthrough moments kept happening july 23 hana had her second eye treated and her parents notified a huge difference right away Hannah was the first patient to receive Luxterna at Chop Hospital and after it was approved by FDA. And because Luxterna is a new treatment, there are still many unknowns about what the future holds for her. Her care team follows her closely. Thank you. If you had any doubts, please comment it on the post box. Next, we are going to see the connector style. We are here to present in connector style. So what is connector style of presentation? In this style, presenters connect with their audience by showing how they're similar to their listeners. Connectors usually enjoy free-form Q&A and use gestures when they speak. They also encourage audience reaction and feedback to what they are saying. A question may pop up in your mind about when and where to use this connector style. Use this style of presenting early as you're learning about the prospect's pain points, challenges, and goals. This type of speaking sets your listeners at ease, elicits feedback on how you are doing in real time, and is more of a dialogue than a one-sided presentation. The topic of our presentation is man versus my book. Sounds interesting, right? I want everyone to guess the actual topic of presentation, and the clue is it is related to antibiotic resistance. I'm sure many of you would have guessed right. Yes, it is super box. Before going into this, let's see about antibiotic resistance. Everywhere we hear about antibiotics and definitely we use it for every other ailments and infections. And that speaks volume of its importance in medicine and healthcare. So what is an antibiotic resistance? Antibiotics are medicines used to prevent and treat bacterial infections. They are produced from microorganisms. Antibiotic resistance occurs when microbes evolve mechanisms that protect them from the effects of antimicrobials. It is one of the biggest global threats to health, food security, and development. So what is a superbug? A pathogenic microorganism, especially a bacterium, that has developed resistance to med medications normally used against it and results in failure of the antibiotic, which can even lead to mortality. The most common types of superbugs are carbapenem resistance intrabacterial C, methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus, nasilia gonorrhoe, acetobacter baumeni, clostridium difficile, and escherichia coli. Reports suggest that in India, over 58,000 babies died in one year as a result of infection with resistant bacteria, usually passed on from their mothers. 25,000 deaths in European Union. 38,000 deaths in Thailand, 23,000 deaths in US. The rates are quite alarming. The World Health Organization, who has categorized the superbugs into three categories based on the level of threats, critical, high, and medium. Now we see the causes of antibiotic resistance. 
overprescribing of antibiotics, patients not finishing their treatment, overuse of antibiotics in livestock and fish farming, poor infection con control in hospitals and clinics, lack of hygiene and poor sanitation, lack of new antibiotics being developed. So what are the causes in which the antibiotic resistance spreads? Antibiotics are given to food producing animals and crops to prevent infections. Animals develop drug resistant bacteria in the gut. Drug resistant bacteria reaches humans to food environment or by direct contact, hence spreads to general public. The another way of antibiotic spreading is antibiotic given to patients develop drug resistant bacteria. Patient attends the hospital or clinic due to pure poor hygiene and unclean facilities spreading to the general public. Before knowing about the ways to combat the drug resistance bacteria, we'll see about what are the different ways. The first is the nanobiotics, the second is phage therapy, and third one is newer antibiotics. Nanobiotics. Designing the nanoparticles to fight against protocols is a modern strategy. The University of Michigan researchers have created a new class of antibiotics using nanoparticles to battle the growing problem. It's in the hospital that the antibiotic resistance bacteria can pose a large threat, especially for those who receive medical implants. Infection due to the device that we put in, that's a big deal, isn't it? The nanoparticle can be thought in two different ways. One, like a regular antibiotic, take it orally or inject it to treat infections. In addition, surface materials are filled which are coated in them, which prevent the biofilm from giving on them. It can be engineered to have specific shapes, sizes, that can coat bucket eaters, pacemakers, etc. Imagine something of one by hundredth of the size of a bacteria. It is made to look like a tiny little pyramid, or a spear, or a frisbee. Nanobiotics are foreign to the bacteria, making it harder to develop resistance. The next one is phage therapy. A phage is a virus that kills the bacteria. We are definitely in a post-antibiotic era, it's getting worse and worse. Hence, it's necessary to devise new methods of killing, killing bacteria. Traditional antibiotics are losing their edge and phages are the new weapon in one's battle against the bacteria. Take a moment and think about a virus. What comes to your mind? An illness, a fear? I'm pretty sure that the first virus that pops up is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But viruses are not all the same. It's true. Some cause devastating diseases, but others can do the exact opposite. They can cure a disease. These viruses are called phages. Here is a real life incident in 2013. A woman had a knee injury, required multiple surgeries. Over the course, she developed a chronic back infection in her leg. Unfortunately, the bacteria causing the infection didn't respond to any of the antibiotic that was available. So at this point, the only option left to stop the infection from spreading further was to amputate the leg. The surgeon was desperate for a different kind of solution. He applied for experimental treatment using phages. And guess what? It worked. Within three weeks of applying for phages, the chronic infection had healed up. Isn't it fascinating? The next is the newer antibiotics. Antibiotics are not only used to cure the infection's diseases, but also facilitate everything from surgery to chemotherapy to organ transplants. Because of bacterial resistance to currently available antibiotics, we have stopped discovering new ones since 1980. But first, how did we get into this situation? The first widely used antibiotic was penicillin, discovered in 1928 by Alexander Fleming. In its 1945 Nobel Prize acceptance speech, Fleming warned that the bacterial resistance had the potential to ruin the miracle of antibiotics. And yes, he was right. In the 1940s and 50s, bacterial resistance already began to appear. Bacteria continued to acquire resistance and pass it along by sharing genetic information between individual bacteria and even across species by conjugation and transformation. What can we do about this? Is there any solution? Yes, it is to create newer antibiotics. In terms of finding new antibiotics, nature offers the most promising new compounds. We can package antibiotics with molecules that inhibit the resistance. One way in which the bacteria develop resistance is the proteins of their own that degrade the drug. By packaging the antibiotics with molecules that block the degraders, 
the antibiotics can do its job. Phages, nanoparticles, and newer antibiotics are promising new arena to combat the antibiotic resistance and in turn, reduce the mortality rates. Let us mind up this presentation by listening to the diary of a micro. <laughs> Hello, I'm Staphylococcus but you can call me Staph. I'm a bacterium that is currently living on your skin, your nose, your genitalia, your mouth, and even in the hands. You might hate me and call me ugly names like John Buck. I still love you. You provide me with food, shelter, and place to regenerate myself, and even a place to regenerate my base product. I love you, human beings. There are several million humans, and for every human being, there are trillions of this bacteria. But you cannot see us, at least not with your naked eye. You humans are very arrogant. You think you can control the world, neither science and technology? Do you really think you are the master? You have been in this world for 1 to 20,000 years. That's a blip in the timeline of the universe. <laughs> we have been around the billions of years, survived it past. Ice ages, meteor strikes, we saw the rise and fall of dinosaurs. We saw ocean state, mountains rise. You know who will survive if the nuclear holocaust? test? That's right, us. We are not bad beings. Mostly we like to live peacefully in your body. We just take some nutrients to feed ourselves and our colonies just like you do. Okay, sometimes we get carried away and migrate deeper into your bodies where the pickings are better. And after we finish that feeding frenzy, we secrete waste into your body, which sadly makes you very hot. You even try to throw out us off your body with repeating coughing, urination, and diarrhea. Usually, Usually, you recover and it's a win-win for you and us. But sometimes, you may die from our infection and we lose our own. Although, you provide lots of good eating for us, other bacteria, even when you're dead. All in all things, we are going pretty well for us until this poison, this crazy evil thing called antibiotics came along. Oh, let's talk about antibiotics. One day... My friend had a wonderful opportunity to explore the bloodstream of men. She was living in during a surgery to remove his appendix. She was enjoying all the proteins when suddenly this penicillin came and started destroying her cell wall. Needless to say, she did not survive as we have only one cell. As if penicillin wasn't enough, humans started producing more villains like cephalosporin, aminoglycosides, and fluoroquinolones. For for more than 50 years, we suffered serious calamities at the hands of these antibiotics. Initially, they would just destroy our cell wall. Later, they just are tearing our DNA apart, destroying our proteins, shredding our nuclei. You almost defeated us, but then you humans grew more arrogant, less thoughtful in your whiskers killing. You forgot that we can fight back? You started bombarding us with the same antibiotics again and again. Even when it wasn't us bacteria, rather tiny virus tickling your nose and making you sneeze, you use penicillin to fight them. Are you kidding me? Those tiny virus don't even have a cell wall. Because if you are judicious trait, we found out how your antibiotics work. We started producing beta lactamase. Bye bye, penicillin. We developed the mechanisms to throw your drugs out of yourself. We even found ways to inactivate your poison slowly, but surely we are becoming resistant and we love it. Today, most of your antibiotics still work. There will be a day when none of your poisons will harm us. Nothing will destroy our colonies. Imagine a world without antibiotics. That's our fairy tale ending, a world where bacteria can live happily ever after. Thank you to hear my story, guys. I hope you all enjoyed
the video. Thank you for listening. Spread awareness, stop resistance. So, so hello everyone, and uh, we are from PhD College of Pharmacy. So we have selected a style which is called as the Lezik style preparation. So what is Lezik style presentation? In the sense, it is a technique which is named for the Lawrence Lezik. Sorry, sir. So, hello, everyone. And uh, we have selected a style which is called as the Lezik style presentation. So, what is Lezik style presentation in the sense? Lezik style is a presentation technique which is mainly named for an author who is called as the Lawrence Lezik, which involves using a large number of styles, which also involves many slides, which of which usually consist of a simple pictures or a few words. Usually, okay, so these kinds of Hello. Sorry, guys. So, hello, everyone. And here we have selected a style which is called as the Lezik style presentation. So, what is Lezik style presentation? In the sense, it is a presentation technique who is, which is mainly named for a Lawrence Lezik, which involves using a large number of slides, each of which usually consists of a simple pictures or a few words. Usually, so these kind of presentations will be mainly used in case of some presenting for a larger crowd, and it usually allows the speaker to use a balanced type of text and images to convey their message. Their rapid pace and rhythm of the slide progression keeps the audience more interactive and admiring. So, so coming to the introduction, which is Nowadays, we witness a phase transition of buying a pattern of many goods, clothes, electronics, furniture, and etc. But nowadays, we usually convert ourselves to offline to online shopping, right? Same like in online pharmacy is going to be the next big evolution that will impact billions of lives and bring a healthy behavioral changes to safe and more convenient tomorrow. So now coming to the what is e-pharmacy in the sense, E-pharmacies are online platforms where the consumers can purchase the medicines without having to visit and brick and mortar all the pharmacies. Usually, in case of the pharmacies, the pharmacies would usually dispense, compound, and formulate. All these kinds of steps will be occurring in case of offline. But in case of online, there is a straight process, which is it makes the process more convenient for the consumers and also results in rising demand for the model across the world. In addition to this, increasing the utilization for the e prescriptions in the hospitals globally it also had led to the growth of these industries so so for example i would like to tell some key players who have been playing in this in this e pharmacies in the sense we usually know what is one ng we have seen many times in advertisements etc and along with this some med plus and any chemist med life, there are many consumers and many companies are present in case of e pharmacies so now coming to the what are the types which are present in e-pharmacies in the sense they are, they are usually mainly two which is one is organized e-pharmacy and second one is the unorganized e-pharmacy. 
So coming to the first one, which is the organized e-pharmacies in the sense, usually they are mainly present in two models which cooperate in this category. The first one is the model place, the marketplace model. And the second one is the inventory based model. The first one, which is the market based model where a technology company connects the neighborhood licensed pharmacies to the end user. And in case of inventory based pharmacy, the e-pharmacy is the online service of an offline licensed pharmacy. So the next one, which is the non-organized e-pharmacy in the sense here, the model prescription medicines are ordered without any valid prescription. So the next one, guys, which is the what are the components who are present in e-pharmacies in the sense generally there are mainly two components present. The first one, which is the technology based components and the second one is the pharmacy retail store components. The first one, which is the technology based components in the sense usually when a, when a person or a consumer adds a web based or a mobile based application for the consumer transmits their transmits their prescription and place their request for the medicines and this kind of orders will be received and verified and checked by the registered pharmacists and finally the registered pharmacists formulates the verified prescription to the pharmacy store and from where the medicines are dispensed by a registered pharmacies so this is the part of the technology wise so when we come to the pharmacy retail shop wise, the registered pharmacists at the store verifies the prescription before dispensing. So this is the main difference between the technology wise as well as the pharmacy retail wise. So uh, the people, when you ask what is the process behind this kind of e-pharmacy in the sense, firstly, who is the customer? So the customer usually uh, usually receives the prescription from the registered uh, prescriber, right? Same like the registered prescription will be uploaded in the site of e-pharmacy. So the second one is the e-pharmacist will usually capture the prescription and they will be verifying all the prescribed data in that prescription. So the next one is, and they will, and the e-pharmacist e will search, will search whether there is there any pharmacies who are present near the customer's place or the region or the locality. So the next one is they will be checking any if there is any availability of medicine in the pharmacy or not. So the next one, they will be filling your orders with the prescription, which is what and all the medicines or what and all the drugs you are ordering or you are being presented in the prescription. They will be comparing with the order and the prescription. So the finally, the payment process, which will be same like visa process or online banking, etc. And finally, the, the customer will be receiving all the medicines in the doorstep. So this is the main process behind the e-pharmacy. So when we come back to the summary, which is the e-pharmacy plays a very important role. The e-pharmacy plays a very important role by forming a bridge, which means between the pharmacies and the customer, which is uh, usually the main disadvantage in case of community pharmacy in the sense there is no sharing of things between the pharmacies and the customer. There is no proper, uh, proper behavior, behavioral changes or some proper communication between the pharmacists and the consumer or, or the customers. But the e-pharmacies plays a very important role in order to in order to find a balance or in order to produce a bridge between the pharmacies and the customer. And, and then the next one, and finally, and uh, um, in the third slide, I have mentioned some examples for e-pharmacy, right? So same founders who have been given some opinions because e-pharmacy is, is one of the most trending topics in pharmacies, right? So they have they have given some opinions regarding the e-pharmacies. For example, the co-founder of MG, uh, MG, which is one gram, which is the Prashant Padon has, has, has given an opinion, which is clicking a picture of the prescription is very easy. He has he has just describing that the prescription, prescription during in case of any pharmacy stores we have to give the prescription to the to the pharmacists and they will be they will be regulating and they will be checking and finally the, the medicine is dispensed right but here the prescription is easily dispensed by a single click he just um, he just defined it and and which is according to the Ziggy who is the co-founder of the of the Prashant Tadon so this is a tricky sector so these are some of the opinions who are given by the the founders of such e-pharmacy to our present so finally when we come to the future, which is the future of the pharmacies, mainly into the pharmacy called e-pharmacy. So the growth of the internet has given rise to various technological driven models to access and serve the consumers in fast pace and most efficient way. And another recent innovation that has positioned itself as an attractive model in the healthcare space is e-pharmacy. So, so that's it from the use guys, because now we have, we have, we have just uh, go through all the style college, basic style, presentation so thanks for this and uh, let me introduce the next slide which is the takeshi style thank Thank you. 
Hello everyone, I am here to present in Takahashi style. The Takahashi method is a technique deploying in extremely simple and distilled visual slides for presentation. It is similar to Lessig method created by Harvard professor and former presidential candidate Florence Lessig. It is named for its inventor Maya Yoshi Takahashi. Protein binding. Introduction. Drug in the body can interact with several tissue components like blood and other extravascular tissues. The interacting molecules may be either protein, DNA, or adipose tissues. Phenomenon of complex formation with proteins is called protein binding of cells. The protein binding can be divided into two types, intracellular protein binding and extracellular protein binding. Intracellular protein binding is nothing but the drug complexes with the protein, that is either receptors, to produce a pharmacological response. Extracellular protein binding is nothing but the drug binds to a protein, either receptor, and produce no pharmacological response. Next, mechanism of action. The mechanism of, uh, mechanism of protein binding is generally reversible and involves weak chemical bonds like hydrogen bonding, hydrophobic bonding, ionic bonds, and weak Van der Waals forces. Sometimes there, uh, there will be irreversible binding, that is covalent bonds formed between tissue, uh, tissues and drug. Example, chloroform uh, under paracetamol metabolites bind to hepatic tissues and results in hepatotoxicity. Next, plasma protein binding. Once the drug enters into systemic circulation, it can interact with several blood components like plasma proteins, blood cells and hemoglobin. Binding of drugs to plasma proteins is generally reversible. The extent of order of protein binding is albumin followed by alpha-1 acid glycoprotein and next comes the lipoproteins and followed by globulins. Next, binding of drugs to albumin which is also known as human serum albumin, shortly HSP. Uh, it is the most abundant plasma protein with a molecular weight of about 65,000. It has large drug binding capacity. Many endogenous compounds like fatty acids, bilirubin, and amino acids like tryptophan, as well as drugs bind to human serum albumin. Mainly a uh, wide variety of drugs like weak acids, bases, and neutral drugs bind to albumin. There are four binding sites in albumin, site 1, site 2, site 3, and site 4. Site 1 binding site is also known as warfarin binding site. Many drugs bind to this binding site. Example, NSAIDs like ketoprofen, ibuprofen, and sulfonamides like sulfonethoxazone and phenytoin bind to site 1 binding site. Site 2, which is also known as diazepam binding site. Many benzodiazepines, fatty acids, and ibuprofen bind to this site 2 binding site. Site 3 and site 4 are of less importance. And site 3 binding site is known as digitoxin binding site. And site 4 is known as tamoxifen binding site. Uh, many drugs bind to uh, both binding sites, which is known as primary and secondary binding site. Example, dipomerol. Uh, the, it binds to site 1 binding site, which is known as primary binding site. And site 2 binding site, which is known as secondary binding site. Next, alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, shortly known as AAG. Its molecular weight is about 44,000 and it is also known as orosomilcoid. It binds to basic drugs like imipramine, quinidin, and propranolol. Lipoproteins. The plasma concentration of lipoproteins is much less compared to alpha-1 acid glycoprotein and albumin. Uh, many highly lipophilic drugs bind to lipoproteins. The drugs bind to lipoproteins by dissolving in the lipid core of protein. As we all know, the lipoprotein is divided into two components, lipids and proteins. The lipid part is composed of uh, triglycerides and cholesterol esters, and protein part is composed of apoproteins. There are four types of lipoproteins, uh, chylomicrons, VLDL, LDL, and HDL. Uh, the uh, lipid part, that is triglycerides and cholesterol esters, are high in chylomicrons, VLDL, and LDL. 
when apoproteins are high in uh, HDA. High partition protein leads to high lipophilicity of drug. Uh, high partition protein drugs bind to lipoprotein specifically. Many acidic drugs, example diclofenac and neutral cyclosporin A, basic drugs chlorpromacin bind effectively to lipoproteins. Next, globulins. There are five types of globulins, alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2 and gamma. Alpha-1 globulins is also known as transportin. It binds to several steroidal drugs like hydrocortisone, prednisone. Uh, alpha-2 globulins is also known as ceruloplasmin. It binds to several fat-soluble uh, fat vitamins like vitamin A, D, E, K and cupric ions. Beta-1 is also known as transferrin. It binds to ferrocyons in hemoglobin. Beta-2 binds to carotenoids and gamma mainly binds to different antigens. Tissue localization. Mm. Yeah. Uh, tissue comprises of about 40% of body weight, that is 100 times that of albumin. Drugs can bind to one or more several tissues. The importance of tissue binding include, it increases the apparent volume of distribution, but the plasma protein binding decreases the apparent volume of distribution. Localization of drug at specific site, that is tissue, increases the half-life of the drug. Uh, example, oxidation metabolites of paracetamol and chloroform uh, localized in the hepatic tissues. Factors that influence tissue localization are lipophilicity, structural features of drug, pH, and partition coefficient. Determination of protein binding. Protein binding can be determined by two ways, indirect techniques and direct techniques. Indirect techniques, which include based on separation of bound form of drug from the free drug molecule. This technique is usually applied in blood samples like serum, plasma, and blood for the determination of percentage of protein binding. The methods involving indirect techniques are equilibrium dialysis, dynamic dialysis, ultrafiltration, diafiltration, ultracentrifugation, and gel filtration. Direct techniques, it do not require separation of bound form of, uh, bound form of drug from the free micromolecule. Uh, it is used in the estimation and uh, estimation of number and character of binding sites in aqueous solution of protein. The methods used in determination are UV spectroscopy, fluorimetry, ion selective electrodes. Factors affecting protein binding. Uh, there are different factors which affect protein binding, which include drug related factors, which comprises of physical chemical uh, characteristics of drug, concentration of drug in the body, and the affinity of drug for a particular binding component. Physical characteristics of drug include high lipophilicity of drug or uh, highly prone to protein binding. Concentration of drug in the body. Several disease states alter both concentration of uh, protein, and thus it may lead to decreased protein binding. Affinity of drug for a particular binding component. Several tissues have several uh, high affinity for certain drugs. Example, digoxin which has high affinity for cardiac muscle than compared to skeletal muscles. Protein-related factors, which also comprise of two parts, physical chemical characteristics of protein and concentration of protein. Physical chemical characteristics of protein include the lipoproteins are highly bound to highly lipophilic drugs. Physical chemical pH determines the add to anionic and cationic groups present on the albumin to bind a variety of drugs. Concentration of protein or binding component among the plasma protein, uh, binding predominantly occurs with albumin as it is present in high concentration in compared to other plasma protein. Next, drug interactions, which comprises of three parts, competition between drugs for binding sites, that is the administration of female butazone on patient with warfarin therapy replaces the warfarin from the binding site which lead to hemorrhagic states. Competition between drug and normal body constituents. The free fatty acids are known to interact with a large number of drugs uh, to bind with HSA. The free fatty acid level may alter in physiological and pathological conditions. Allosteric binding site in protein molecule. Uh, several drug molecules can change the structure of protein, which alters the protein binding. Example, aspirin acetylates the lysine fraction of albumin, thereby modifying its capacity to bind NSAIDs like 
phenyl beta zero. Patient related factors. Uh, it includes age, intersubject variability, and disease rate. Age. The neonates contain very low albumin content than that of uh, adults. Therefore, uh, more free drug will be available, uh, available in the uh, blood. Young infants, which have more uh, albumin content than compared to adults, the high dose of digoxin is required for young infants. Elderly, low albumin content, so more free drug is available. In the subject variability, it is due to genetics and environmental factors. Disease state, which include renal failure. Renal failure leads to hypoalbuminemia, which leads to decreased binding of acidic drugs. And hepatic failure, which leads to decreased albumin synthesis and decreased binding of acidic drugs. Inflammatory states like surgery and trauma leads to increased alpha-1 acid glycoprotein levels, which increases the binding of basic drugs. In significance of protein binding, absorption, the absorption of protein binding is affected, uh, uh, absorption of free drugs is affected due to protein binding. Normally, the conventional dosage form follows first order kinetics. When there is protein binding, it disturbs the absorption equilibrium. Distribution, as protein bound drug is particularly do not cross blood brain barrier and placental barrier, thus protein binding decreases the distribution of drugs. Metabolism. Protein binding decreases the metabolism of drugs, enhances the biological half life. Only unbound drugs can get metabolized. Example, phenyl glutathione. Elimination. Only the unbound drug is capable of being eliminated. Protein binding prevents the entry of drugs into metabolizing organs like liver and to glomerulus. Example, tetracycline is mainly eliminated by glomerular filtration. Systemic solubility. As said before, lipoprotein acts as a vehicle for highly lipophilic drugs like steroids, heparin, and oil soluble vitamins. Drug action protein binding inactivates the drug because sufficient concentration of drug cannot be built up in the receptor site for action. Sustained release the complex of drug protein in the blood acts as a reservoir and continues supply the free drug. Example suramine sodium protein binding for anti trypanosomal action. Diagnosis, the fluorine atom of chloroquine replaced with radio-labeled I-131 can be used to visualize melanomas of eye and disorders of thyroid gland. Plasma protein versus biological barrier. The various biological barriers include blood brain barrier, blood uh, testis barrier, placental barrier. And all these barriers are uh, tightly packed with tight junctions. Therefore, uh, only highly lipophilic drugs can cross the biological barriers. Protein binding of hydrophilic drugs is, uh, affects the uh, transfer of drugs through biological barriers. These are the references. Thank you for this. Uh, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, I hope uh, this session was uh, informative and useful for you all. Uh, and any suggestions or questions, please send it to the chat box. So, uh, next over to uh, Saranya Madam and Sangeeta. Thank you, Shivakumar sir. If you have any questions, participant, uh, you can. Put your questions in the chat box. <laughs> okay. Um, first, I thank Dr. S. Lavanya, Professor, Department of Pharmacy Practice. And Mr. D. Shivakumar, sir, Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry, and Mr. M. Nityanand, sir, Department of Pharmaceutics, for handling this hands on training in oral presentation models. Uh, uh, Ma'am, and sir, it, uh, really it was a wonderful session. Uh, really, our participants would have been benefited by the different types of uh, oral presentation which you have given today. Uh, thank you all. Thank you once again. Uh, I thank the participants also for joining this session.
dear participants, uh, the, the tomorrow's link will be sent to your mail ID. Uh, kindly join the session before 15 minutes. That session will start by uh, 10 a.m. You can join by uh, 9.45 a.m. Uh, it, it will also be shared in the WhatsApp group also, and it will be shared in the layer, your e e email ID also. Thank you. Thank you all. The session is over. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.